Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today I will be speaking to a colleague of mine who is a eye clinic liaison officer. The role of an eye clinic liaison officer is so fundamentally important to the eye care services that a community provides for its individuals. Please stay tuned to learn more about this and I'm sure you'll find it very interesting um, as I did carrying out the interview process. Thank you. So thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Um, I am joined by my colleague, um, Ruth, who is a ECLO. She will describe um, what an ECLO is and so much more in this video. So without further ado, um, would you mind kindly introducing yourself, Ruth, and then just letting us know what your role as an ECLO is, please. Okay, so my name is Ruth and I'm an ECLO, which means Eye Clinic Liaison Officer which sounds really fancy, but basically is there to make sure that patients have support and information so that they understand their treatment, so that they can be supported if they're having difficulties because their vision's deteriorated, and just basically to make sure that we look after patients when they're not in clinic, which is most of the time when their sight maybe causes them the most difficulties or worries. Perfect, thank you. The next question then leading on from that is, um, how and why did you decide to become an ECLO and what was the training path to become an ECLO? Okay, so my background is in health and social care. I trained as a nurse and I worked in social care type roles for many years, including some advocacy and working with people with dementia. So I had kind of a general idea of, of those sorts of services, but I was quite keen to get back into health, having left a long time ago. Um, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back into nursing. So when I saw this job advertised, I thought it was a really good opportunity to be able to work in a hospital environment, but not necessarily in a clinical role. And I've learned a lot about eyes and most of the training is on the job. So I did a course that was validated by the University of London, which was run by RNIB. So there was some training about eye conditions and support services and all sorts of things. But to be honest, most of the learning is done in clinic with clinical colleagues, be they ophthalmologists, orthoptists, optometrists, learning about eye conditions, learning about how they impact on people, and also learning about services in the community and how we can link people up with the right support. Perfect. What would you say um, a typical day looks like for you? Well, I suppose there is no typical day. They're all very different. I never know quite what's going to come on the phone or what's going to come through the door. But my days generally are spent either in the adult or paediatric clinics. Um, and I do support children and babies as well as, as adults. And it's sort of, it can vary. It might be someone's asking me to see a patient that's just been diagnosed with an eye, an eye condition or sight loss and they're very distressed, very worried. It might be someone who's had sight loss for a very long time and they've suddenly run into trouble with something, be that maybe um, reading or their mobility. Or it might be someone who's been very gradually losing their sight over a long period of time, like some of our age-related macular degeneration patients, who who just are a bit isolated and a bit worried and, and need to be put in touch with support services. And, and these referrals come over the phone. They sometimes I'll talk to people by email sometimes just in the waiting room or during their appointment. It's really, really varied. But some days I sit in specific clinics so I can see patients like sort of the children's clinics, but no two days are ever quite the same. And I kind of design my own timetable. So I try and kind of cover as much as I can, but I can see anybody from a baby to someone who's a hundred all in the same day. And sometimes it's quite strange how their needs are very similar, but very different. You know, that something is causing them trouble because of their sight. And my job is to help work out how we can make that, that difficulty easier. Very interesting. Um, you touched on a few conditions um, during that answer, mm -hmm. what, uh, namely macular degeneration. What would you say are the um, common eye conditions you tend to encounter in the patients that you tend to see? Okay, so um, I tend to see a lot of patients who have age-related macular degeneration, AMD, 
be that the wet or the dry kind. The wet kind, the ones who are coming into clinic for treatment, often the ones that I deal with who are out in the community, but they phone up because they've got some problems, have the dry kind. So they're not actually having any treatment, but their sight's getting worse. Deal with patients with glaucoma, complications from diabetes. A lot of the conditions that I see are quite unusual because we get patients from all over coming because of the type of hospital and clinic we are. So I see quite a few patients who have genetic eye conditions, so retinitis pigmentosa or Stargardt's, for example, um, which are a lot more unusual. Um, I think I forget how unusual they are sometimes because I see quite a few of them. Um, and they're often younger patients or children. Um, and it sometimes can be quite an interesting journey with them when they start off at being diagnosed and then over several years their vision changes and their support needs change. But those are the sort of main conditions that, that I would see in clinic on a kind of weekly basis. Definitely the huge, vast majority is, is AMD. Okay. Um, and what would you say you've perceived or seen to be some of the impacts of these eye conditions upon the mental health of individuals that you have worked with? Okay. So if I could like put one big word up on a screen that would cover what about, you know, what my patients tell me, the biggest one is frustration. Um, they become very frustrated because a lot of the things that they used to be able to do often really, really easily, like reading, cooking, crossing a road, climbing stairs, really straightforward stuff that I take for granted every single day has suddenly become difficult or impossible. So frustration, and from that frustration often becomes a lot of anger um, and and sadness. It's it's often a bit like what we might describe a grief process, because especially if people lose, lose their sight quite suddenly, it can be such a huge adjustment. And also just being told that you're likely to lose your sight, it's very frightening. Uncertainty, again, brings back the frustration. They, they'll have patients who often say, well, what's going to happen? How long will I be able to see like this? Well, what will change? And unfortunately, we often can't give them an answer. And and that's really hard. Patients become can become very low in mood. They can become very sad, very isolated. And part of my job is to sort of try and preempt that. And if we can get to them quite early in the process, we can kind of try and mitigate that a bit. But it's difficult because you know, statistically, if you have sight loss, you have a very high chance of having depression and, and mental health problems. And that's really understandable, especially if it's a sudden or a new thing that you, you know, you really weren't expecting. Having said that, I meet people who've had sight loss all their lives and it has a huge impact on their mental health at different times. Different things trigger feelings of grief or loss. But it's it's kind of trying to understand that everybody's different but there are some common things that do go on and trying to make sure that we don't let people get to a crisis point, that we work with them as, as well as we can for as long as we need to, to stop those mental health problems becoming really entrenched and difficult. Um, and as obvious as it may be to you and I, because we've encamp interacted with such patients, um, can you just give us a few examples of the things that we may take for granted in terms of our day-to-day -day lives that patients who have severe sight impairment or who are sight impaired would struggle with um, in their day-to-day -day lives? Okay, so the first thing that patients invariably tell me they have difficulty with is reading. And that may not necessarily mean reading books or you know reading you know things of any great length it's sometimes something as simple as being able to read the dates on a on a tin or a packet or reading actually what's in sort of something in a shop reading signs um reading their post you know sometimes they tell me that they have to get their partner or, or parent to read all their letters which is you know takes away a lot of privacy but often as well it is the reading reading for pleasure reading for enjoyment reading as a hobby, lots of people find that something they, they're, they're really sad when they find that difficult and can't do it anymore. Um, and watching television, um, you know, the sorts of things that are, you know, something that you and I would do every day. And the other big thing that gets impacted is people's mobility. So their ability to get out and about, to go to work, to uh, travel and, and even just getting around their own homes. Often that's easier because it's familiar, but often people become quite isolated because they're fearful to go out to try and cross a road. They don't 
want to go on public transport because it's difficult to, to see the numbers of the buses or the trains. So even simple things like crossing roads, negotiating traffic, that can be huge. And between those two things, it can often leave people feeling very dependent. They'll often say, I don't go out on my own, which, as you can imagine, if you're used to just getting up, getting dressed and going to work or going to see your friends or whatever it is, to not be able to do that unless somebody else is there to help you. You know, that's that takes away a lot of independence often from some very young people. Mm -hmm. um, and things, other things then, with especially younger people that we take for granted, using technology, being able to get online, being able to communicate with people and see websites, going places to for leisure, they're often really difficult if you've got sight loss. And we live in a world where people don't often understand what it's like and how to support people and those sorts of things keep it, going to work you know just being able to keep a job very few people with sight loss keep their jobs and that's crazy because most of them are very capable and very competent but they lose their confidence or the adaptations aren't made and often that's around really simple things like being able to use their computer and being able to travel to and from work so yeah, it's just the basic stuff that we really just do all day, every day, that that they get very frustrated that they can't do and they want to do. And actually they can do because we can support them to learn how to mobilise on their own, to get out and about, whether that's using a, a cane or a guide dog. It's, it, it's not the case that once you lose your sight that you will never do things independently but we may have to help and support you to relearn skills and to develop new skills so that you can do all of the things that a sighted person would do but just doing them differently thank you um i have a final question which is a two-part question okay so the first part is um how would somebody um get to see you to tap into your expertise as an echo that's part one and then part two is um Presumably, when you see these patients, um, they come accompanied with family members. Mm -hmm. If the family members are struggling to deal with the diagnosis and are potentially going through a grieving process mm -hmm. of their own, within your capacity as an ECLO, do you have um, the authority, I guess, to support them okay. as well as the patient? So to see me or to speak to an ECLO pretty much anywhere, you can... You can be just put in touch with one at your local eye clinic very easily. If you attend an eye clinic, you can just ask to see the ECLO. However, if you go and see an optician, if you aren't actually under the care of any sort of eye health services, you can usually find out who's the ECLO in your local hospital. You can ring the RNIB helpline and they will point you in the direction of your ECLO. And, you know, pretty much anybody who's worried about their sight or the impact it's having on them, or their family, friends or relatives can be in touch with us and we can support them. We're not just there for the patient, even though that's most of the time, because often you can't just support the patient. They, their family member might be struggling as well. You know, sometimes we're actually supporting the relative more for a certain period of time than the actual patient because they are having to, maybe, maybe they've suddenly almost had to become a carer for somebody, whereas before that, they weren't, they were just a married couple, for example, or a, a parent and a child, an adult child. So often with children, a lot of our work is supporting the parents because there comes a huge different kind of grieving process when you're told that your child may have a disability and they are left with lots of questions and worries. And whilst it's still that, you know, reminding them that it's still their child, that this is, that there are huge possibilities that we're going to support them, their child will do amazingly. They often feel a sense of loss and it's helping them to deal with the, the huge adjustment that is in fact what they're feeling. So we support anybody that feels they need to access our service. If, they dis if we work out there's someone that's better to support them and better place to, we'll just refer on to that person. But generally, anybody it's an open access service you don't just come and see me once you can come and see me as often as you want and we will work out each time what needs to happen next and sometimes that's just someone phoning up for a chat and with a bit of reassurance and a bit of support they go on their way but sometimes something has changed and we need to help them in a different way very final question i promise go for it do you have any patient stories that you hold dear to your heart 
um, whereby yeah. you've done something for somebody that perhaps they didn't think was possible, a service you've signposted them to or provided for okay. them, um, that they've then come back to you and said that was actually quite life changing okay. in the sort of circumstance that they were in. So does anything sort of okay. come to mind? I've got a few, but I think one that um, one that actually turned out to be a bit life changing for me back in return, which was interesting. Um, was I supported a patient and his wife and he lost his sight very suddenly. It was a very distressing and traumatic kind of thing. And it wasn't actually that long after I'd started the job, so it was really in at the deep end. And we got a huge amount done for this gentleman over a long period of time. This was not like a one-stop shop, this took a while. And we sorted out welfare benefits, we sorted out training to use technology, we sorted out mobility training so he could get out and about again all sorts of different things we got you know we did did lots and lots and then um several months later um i was watching the cardiff half marathon and his wife ran past me and she was raising money for the charity that i work for and um so i ran about 10 feet with her and then thought i'm gonna die i can't breathe i'm so unfit and then i um i, I said to her i said i'm gonna do this next year so we turned his life around and their lives around and to this day i whenever i see them the difference in you know where what was an awful situation really just you know it, it was amazing but it did end up with me then taking up running and running a half marathon so i'm not sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing but it certainly turned my life upside down but i, th I think the other really nice one was recently someone very young from the first few times that i met her um, she'd lost her sight. She was very young. She was distraught. You know, it was just such a horrible, difficult situation. And she'd just been told that the damage to her eyes were, wasn't repairable, that this was this was it. And all I did was just spend some time with her. We talked and we agreed that we would pass her on to a team in the community that would help her start to get her independence back. Because at the time, even though she was in her 20s, her parents and her partner were having to do everything. And And she was really not in a good way and then about six weeks later she came back to clinic and i got called in to speak to her and i was like this is a different person sat in front of me because her, her head was up her shoulders were back she just looked like a confident person again and then um, i was like what has gone on here and she basically just had some support in the community and started to relearn some skills and rebuild her confidence and then about six weeks later again she came back and she said i have to see you and i was like okay so i've got something for you and she said i always used to love baking and i hadn't done it for the longest time because i couldn't see the scales i couldn't see what i was cooking and i just didn't think i could do it and she she bought me like some cakes mm, which that. were lovely but also it was like yeah it was more it was about more than the cakes it was mm. the fact that she felt with that help that she could do that again mm. and she was like just such a different person and she said herself she had bad days and good days but it was like what would have been if we not done that the bad days would have stayed but yeah and the cakes were really nice and i'm not running any more half marathons <laughs> um thank you so much for joining us i'm really grateful to you for your time That's okay. and providing us with an insight as to what you do um um thank you so much that's okay thank you very much for watching this video about the role of an eye clinic liaison officer. I certainly learned a lot more um, about the role of an eye clinic liaison officer, in particular, the vast amount of services that they can provide and signpost patients to. In addition to that, the um, ways in which patients can get to actually see an echo. If you found this video useful, please do click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and stay tuned for more um, similar videos to hopefully be produced in the near future. Thank you so much, take care.